Right, we're rolling. On this podcast, we'll be talking about different areas of business and all things marketing. My name is Dave Doyle. And I'm Dave Alton. This is Social Antics, another marketing podcast. Hey guys, welcome back to Social Antics, another marketing podcast. Dave, how are you this week? I am in a great mood. I'm enjoying the implosion of the Royals currently at present. <laughs> Going down in tackles. That's basically <laughs> occupied. That's occupied, not my day to be fair, but at least 15, 20 minutes this morning, which kind of, you know, was enjoyable enough. Yeah. So we're, um, recording, we're recording this on the day, basically. The, uh, the, the day the day after the, the Oprah Winfrey interview, basically. Uh, the day after the Oprah Winfrey interview, um, all just chaos, absolute chaos and carnage. Like you couldn't make it up. I'd say their PR advisor is furious. Yeah, great Wherever, track, it's kind of, I suppose it's something from PR, like is it something you want to work on or something you'd want to stay clear of? Absolutely stay clear of. The, <laughs> the, 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 the wife of the member of the royal family who has left has accused the royal family of being racist. That is the definition <laughs> of you not wanting to go near that because no matter what they say, they lose, basically. Yeah. Like, yeah. oh, it's absolutely... Because if they come out and they say oh no we're not racist then people bring up Prince Andrew and you didn't do anything here but Prince Andrew despite the fact that he's a big pervert and <laughs> but then you've got on the other side of the pond you've got Meghan Mark and Mar- Markle given out and she doesn't exactly come across great either let's let's call a spade a spade like there's a touch of the kind of fairy tale princess about the whole kind of situation so or it's just like these people these people live in a warped reality and I will never understand them and that's absolutely fine with me I think I should always before I ask you how you're doing just kind of generally ask you off air how are you doing do you need a rant are you, are you feeling Irish <laughs> It wasn't a rant, that was just, that was just facts. <laughs> just facts, according to uh, credible sources. Yeah, absolutely. So this week on the show, we have a guest, uh, Dennis Pimber Crohn from, well, thought he was from Galway, he's not, he's from Cork, uh, but up in Galway, doing well for himself in the, the whole area, marketing and digital marketing. Um, very, very good content creation, working with Connolly's Motor Group, uh, doing his own stuff on the side, um, been involved in a lot of projects over the last couple of years. So I think it'd be good to chat around the whole that whole area. What do you think, Dave? No, it sounds great to me. Uh, good to get a, another marketer on, specifically one with a lot of kind of interest in um, content creation. So, on. so let's go. On tonight's show, we have, well, I'm going to get this wrong straight away. I, I see Dinny, I see Dennis, I see, will you explain who you are, will you, for the people listening? Yeah. Um, well, my, my, my real name is Dennis Finbar Crone, and that's what I go as uh, in my professional life. I told you. But uh, on, online, I go by Dinny and the Dinny Crow Show. Um, yeah, I'm just d- delighted to be here, lads. Thanks so much for having me on. No I do a bit pleasure. of digital marketing there at the moment for the Connolly Motor Group, uh, which are uh, quite a large motor group in the west of Ireland. And uh, I've got a master's in digital marketing. So that's how I came across your podcast. I think I follow you already, Dave. I'd say that's how your marketing skills uh, appeal to me. And I click through to see what is this actually about? And it's, it's, yeah, it's I, would, I would normally show. I would normally say which day are you on about? Post, um, for anyone that's listened before, will know that the other day just doesn't do social. Uh, social for uh, a fellow that teaches digital yeah. marketing. We hate social. So uh, it's funny. <laughs> but tell me, the first thing I noticed anyway is if you follow you on social, I swear you were from Galway. And it's only when I done a bit of a creep during the week to find out a bit more about you. I found uh was a Bruce College, Griffith College. Um so you're you're actually a Cork man, are you? Yeah, yeah. I'm originally from Cork. I did my undergrad in Griffith, as you said, and then I moved up here, Jesus, two years ago now, and I did my master's in digital marketing in NUI, uh Galway. And yeah, I just I think it was the best thing I ever did because believe it or not, there's I suppose you're not from Cork either. You're where did you say you're from Wexford? Uh, Wexford, yeah. When you're from Cork, it's it's weird to to leave the place. I actually I can't believe I've stayed away uh, for two years, to be honest with you. But uh, I know I'm fairly settled up here now, to be honest with you. But it's it's weird to see there's more to life than Cork, even though a lot of people <laughs> don't want to admit it. I have a lot of friends back home that won't leave at all. And do you know what? That says how great of a place it is to live, uh, more than anything. And tell me, what did you study marketing here in Cork before you went to study marketing in Galway? 
yeah, so I would have done my undergrad business studies business. and I, I kind of specialized in, in marketing and it was just kind of, it was the, the subjects I really enjoyed the most compared to um, the accounting side of it and all that kind of boring crack. <laughs> I like the creative side of it and kind of going outside the box as much as I can anyway with things. Yeah. And do you find the, like we've, we've talked about it here before in terms of Cork and local, like it, there is actually a decent, um, I suppose a decent scene for, for social media content creators, marketing, and it's only kind of increasing. Like, is that the case up in Galway as well? Um, yeah, there is. It's, it's what, what I'd say about Galway compared to Cork is Galway is very much like a town. So it's, it's tiny. Um, whereas Cork is the proper city and you kind of have it split from my point of view anyway between the people that are kind of qualified to be talking about things and the crowd that are kind of bluffing things um, and but in Cork there is a really really nice scene like you have uh, Muriel Foley Pamela Kiley would be two of the people I'd follow from Cork that I know and they're 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 brilliant at it um, and yourself as well Dave obviously <laughs> um, but yeah no there is there is a good scene I think the likes of Republican work and they've a uh, the similar thing up here called the Porter Shade it's like those type of hubs are great for like marketing minds to kind of meet especially when you mightn't have that infrastructure of like you know a massive organization to work with having those type of hubs they do uh, they do great for the, the marketing side of things I see the Re Republic of Work this week are doing loads of uh, lives and stuff for I think it's International Women's Day yeah, today, actually. Day, yeah. yeah, so like all those things, they all help. But I, I think a lot of it is about kind of like uh, helping each other out as well in Cork anyway. I, I More so since I left, I've seen everyone kind of collaborating a lot more, which is which is great to see, especially, I suppose, with COVID, businesses ha have had to adapt to really more than anything. I think you'll find that actually, and it's not, even for those who aren't running businesses or starting businesses, or a public work did and are still doing, which is pretty well, obviously not now because we're all fucking locked inside. But those little events that they did or those talks that they did were very, very casual. Go on, have a couple of beers, um, have a chat with the people, meet a few people, go for a few pints afterward. That casual midweek kind of you know, fun thing, but you're kind of, you're rewarding yourself with a few pints because you've done something related to educating yourself. So it's allowed kind of a thing like, you know, and that was really like, for me, that was very helpful just meeting different people because like I always find if you go to something called a networking event, you will never ever network because it's called a networking event. And it's just that, the most- You just don't like talking to people, that's forced, all. <laughs> oh, it's absolutely horrible environment to be in. Whereas if you're going on to something that you're actually happy to be at, and then you happen to meet other people, that's the best type of networking, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I actually would have seen that. And it's it's gas you say that. When I, I, I was doing events, um, but while I was doing my undergrad, I was doing these charity events around Cork. You probably haven't heard of this. My marketing wasn't up to scratch at the time, but it was called Cork Lift Fest. It was kind of a health and fitness focus event series. I, I We did three of them. We did them way too quickly after each other. But at that, it was like exactly the same as what you're just saying there, Dave. Like it was just people that were all kind of into social media gathered. And it's, it's actually insane where the people that uh, were at that very first event I ran are now. Like, I think the guys, I don't know, have you heard of 528 Creative? Mm -hmm, yeah. the, uh, I think Mark Goyery, who's one half of that, he was he was actually at that. He's running his own successful business. And pretty much that's the same for most of the people involved in it anyway, which is great to see. But like that, like there's, there's those type of events are so important. And it's, it's something we're really lacking now more than anything is like having that like actual face-to-face -face interaction. And like you said, even having a couple of beers with someone and chatting about work, which is always great to do. Like, and in terms of the, the the education side of things, then did you find yourself gravitating even in in within college in terms of going down the route of more social media stuff than the say the strategy or or even SEO? You know, did you find yourself gravitating always towards social? Um, yeah, kind of. I think do you know what I I started. I was doing my. I had a YouTube channel as well. What I still do, but I had a kind of a YouTube chat show at one point, where I was interviewing people, and that's kind of kind of how I got started and all this sort of jazz. But I I start, and I was doing those events out of that. But I I think I realized the power of it then. Uh, once I started using it for my parents' business at home, and uh, they have a co-chair company, and like we were able to kind of sell out nights uh, with the buses, the yard empty. And it was just through like the social media, which, and 
not even paid social, like organically. Now, it, obviously, it was event dependent, etc. But I just I started focusing on that a bit more, and I realized the power of it. And then, just more so, I was actually meant to go teaching, which you believe, uh, secondary school teaching. But I said, you know what, I, I won't be able to stick that for two years. And I, I kind of, I always wanted to kind of work online and like in the social media world, and whether that was like as a content creator slash blogger at one point, I had awful notions about myself there a couple of years ago. But I think the more I've the more I've worked in it now, the last year, year or two, I've realized how that side of things is like so toxic for you. And I'd actually agree with you, Dave, in the sense, I understand now why someone that would, we'd say be a lecturer in marketing, wouldn't use it himself. And like, the more I work in it, and the deeper you go in, the more you realize like, all of this social stuff, it's unbelievable for businesses. It's horrific for humans. I actually saw, I saw a great thing. Um, I was actually only looking back at old posts on like, say, I can't remember, was either HubSpot or Hootsuite. It was one of those Instagram uh, channels. But I was looking back at them. Um, it was basically mental health tips for social media managers. It was actually based towards like employers. And it was saying, you know, you wouldn't send, it was basically along the lines of COVID. It was saying you wouldn't send your worker out now without PPE. They were saying you shouldn't, you know, you should think about the same about your social media managers. They're constantly in this bubble of, as you say, to toxic, to, uh, toxic environment, you know. And um, so they were saying, you know, you, you need downtime. They need to be looked after in terms of uh, a, a group to talk to other social. Because generally, when it comes to social media managers, you're generally the only one in the company that really kind of looks after that area of the business. There's not a group you really, you know, especially in small businesses like like we might be involved in. Um, so it is it is that kind of thing you know it's something to think about I think for that kind of level of looking after yourself when you're dealing with social because it, it can be a toxic place you, yeah, yeah you, you, you grow a thick skin as well though right like I think there's a big difference between managing a business social media account and people having to go at the business versus you writing blogs or doing whatever you're doing and people just absolutely hammering you for absolutely no reason and I think it was a comedian Darrow Breen he did a gig years ago and he described Twitter perfectly in a normal kind of a world. If there was a bloke and he's selling guitar lessons, he goes into his local centra, goes up to the little community board and puts up a poster saying guitar lessons, call whoever. In a social media world, you put up the poster saying guitar lessons, ring this number. And someone comes up behind you and taps you on the shoulder and goes, I don't want guitar lessons. Why are you putting guitar lessons up? Well, you're terrible at doing guitar lessons. What gives you the right to do guitar lessons? How dare you, you know, be if you're offending me with your guitar lessons? Like, and that's basically what it is. Everyone just has a go at everything, and it's just like it's incredible. Like, yeah, absolutely. I, I actually think the cancel culture that exists there now is uh, frightening. It's so quick and it's so like daily. And I, I I've heard you talk about it, but like all these people kind of just giving out for the sake of giving out like there's a massive difference between someone like genuinely offending a demographic or a, a group as opposed to people just like even there i'll give you an example i today is international women's day i had to think so much about the copy i was writing about just saying happy international women's day and try and tying that into the business. And it's it's something that I you just have to be so conscious because the second you slip up, people bounce. Yeah, the true, they do true. And then and you're going to be spending weeks basically tackling that. Um, it was actually interesting a few weeks ago. Um, not sure if you listen out when we had uh, Jonathan Healy on. I'm not sure if you're aware of Jonathan, but but like that, he was thinking, you know, that you really have to kind of craft out your story and what you're talking about. You can't just hop on. We've talked about it before, about in terms of woke marketing, about just hopping on bandwagons, you know, and that can, it can be that kind of case sometimes where people are just going down for the for the trendiness of it. You know that it's something everyone else is talking about. I need to talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. There's there's definitely a kind of a bandwagon culture equal to the cancel culture. And I think even more so, I think like from one thing I do a lot of is I, I work with like content creators and bloggers and stuff. And even with my work at the moment, I do a lot with like brand ambassadors. And like when you're working with people like that, as much as a doing as we'd say, particularly like bloggers and stuff get, a lot of it rightly deserves for the nefarious practices they're up to. Like sometimes you got to realize like they're, like they're like probably the most like, they, 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 they can be very unfulfilled those individuals in particular and 
I actually, one of my lecturers from NUI had did a research study there the other, I think it only came out this week, um, about like Instagram and the likes and stuff and how people that use social media more are actually lonelier than those that don't. So Dave, if anything, your lack of socials is a good thing. You're you're not you're a fulfilled human, but like it's yeah, it's, I, I it's, that's the biggest compliment I think he ever got. <laughs> I am like um, I'm like your man. Who's the fellow who lives up the mountain? The baldy fella. The Dalai Lamb. I'm like the Dalai Lamb. The bald. Brilliant. I was like, where is he going with the See what I was thinking, thinking, of the thinking before you speak? See what I mean? See how we can get ourselves in trouble here. No, yeah. not a chance. Not you mentioned you chance. mentioned there about um bloggers and brand ambassadors and all that kind of area. Do you know from watching um your own channels, like you know, you were kind of involved in, I suppose, the whole you know, you'll be involved in a few of the influencers and that kind of side of things, you know, and, and influencers definitely, you know, and influencer marketing has definitely become a, a dirty term in the last kind of couple of years. And, you know, people trust it. They don't like it. If you're in that area, it's the best thing in the world. You know, what what kind of, what's your thoughts on that whole area? Um, I I think like having the, the right ambassador for you is so key as a, as a business, definitely. I, I can even see with some of the, the partnerships that I work with on a daily, like, the, the power these people have is frightening when you hit them properly. The problem with it, and I think the issue with all of this is that it's become a culture where everyone's striving to be there and the key opinion leaders from bygone days, the likes of the GA stars, the likes of the rock stars who have like a key influence, a proper like tangible influence are, are being diluted by creators. And some, some are really good. You look at like someone like Tyg Fleming He'd be great for a lot of businesses, really, if you're looking to shift products or anything like that. He'd be a great example of, you know, working with him would be, I'd say, he'd be expensive to work with now, but he, he'd be... Especially like, after he, his win last night, was it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, you, you pay well for those gassies, I tell you. <laughs> um, <laughs> in more ways than one, I'd say. But um, <laughs> they, the, the likes of him, he, he's a great example of someone that we'd say wouldn't be a traditional key opinion leader but more so a content creator that he'll make cool stuff for your business but i think the problem is and it, particularly business owners that wouldn't be kind of well informed there's so many of these different bloggers out there you'll easily get burnt and i've seen it I've seen a lot of businesses get kind of burnt by people and this idea of give me something for free is like the handouts uh, if you saw some of the messages uh, that 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 i've gotten in the past couple of months you'd be shocked um i think of one example i'm trying not to don't not name to anyone myself. no i wouldn't name anyone I'm trying <laughs> to see i i know of a business that was approached to give someone a discount on a quite a substantial product like we'd say a very expensive item and when the business didn't get back to them and the person went anyway and bought this extremely expensive item and posted as if they were a brand ambassador for the business. Uh, and like fake, so like they were buying this item. I, I, like, I suppose I can say it. I, I know of a scenario. I, I'm trying to, I, I know of a scenario where- Stop beating around the bush now. And... Yeah. Well, a, fr a friend of mine who also works in the motor industry. Um, <laughs> What the fuck an Egypt bought a car and decided to say it was a gift? Yeah, <laughs> so somebody, yeah, they bought a car, right? Uh, this is from my friend who works in it, was telling me that they bought a car after contacting the business to say, hey, can I get a discount on this car? And they they went away. They, they bought this car, it was nearly 50 grand, and put it up as if they're a brand ambassador uh, and faked that they're just brand ambassador. And apparently that's really common now. And I've heard loads of different stories from my friends that are working for different businesses. And I kind of get it. It'd be kind of like when you buy, I don't know, like a gym plus, I know it's very common. I've done it myself. Buy an old gym plus coffee jacket and you tag them. Do you use well, I, don't, I, don't think there's any, I don't think there's any problem in tagging. Like, you know, if you're going down that route of wanting to, to go into that line of work, I don't think there's any problem in tagging things, but just don't make it look like you are giving it, do you know? Yeah. Because it's not, well, it, could, it might not be healthy for the brand either. Oh, exactly. And on top of that, I think the girl, your man was saying, what was he saying? She hashtagged ad. Yeah. So, and deleted the comment when they were like, thanks for shopping with us. So like, 
but that's the culture we live in now. Whereas you'd rather, even though that girl clearly is doing well for herself to be able to afford that <laughs> car yeah. or whatever, like to turn around and just fake it for the sake of the gram is so so sad more than anything and i think that that's a good example of how this whole industry has gone where it's kind of literally fake it till you make it but like i i think for businesses it's about finding someone that even though they mightn't have the massive following um like one thing i've done since i started my role was i got in uh, a micro influencer into one of the sites we have that we don't get up to as much and her job on a weekly is to create some content for us for the socials and she's hugely beneficial because, right, she probably doesn't have a massive following, but she's creating valuable content for us on the daily within a certain geographical range. And she's consistent. And at the end of the day, I can text her and say, hey, we want you to do this piece of content today. No bother than us. Whereas when you're dealing with bigger influencers, you have bigger, like, kind of standards oh, no i'm only doing one picture a month yeah yeah i'll do that, that wasn't that wasn't in the contract kind of a thing oh massively yeah but when you mentioned there um you know you mentioned say ty fleming now or someone like that and i know he's done say for you know you're in the, the motor industry in terms of um Connolly's motor group but i've seen ty doing work with other car brands and stuff like that and promoting them or i've seen him doing stuff with uh was a fanta there recently he done something as well with do you think that has an impact on sales like is it worth the money or do you think it's just purely brand awareness like yeah it's 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 something i think that's a million dollar question to be honest with you um i think like i'll give you an example up here in galway we've um joe canning is a brand ambassador yeah uh for for audi and he's 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 fantastic because joe canning is seen as like the god up here and rightly so in terms of his on on the on the field and off the the field behavior like he's outstanding and for us like he's the perfect demographic for who'd be buying the car etc so I, I i don't think you can tangibly measure it now it's something i'd love to do but i don't think i'll ever be allowed is like we'd say do some sort of an offer with a brand ambassador and see what is the click through now obviously when you're dealing with cars and stuff it's kind of hard you're not going to be giving away a free pair of wipers or do you know what i mean someone's not going to be swayed that way so it's, it's, hard it's, a, it's a big yeah it's a big purchase you can't it's not going yeah. to it's not going to it's have three, the same effect three, as fast moving three but. pair of second hand tires for the the, winner <laughs> of the like and share competition yeah, listen to del boy there yeah <laughs> it's 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 a it is it is a very interesting one though because a friend of mine started a new clothing business uh he's from cork as well and he was in touch with me about like you know trying to get influencers involved for his business and like the thing is so saturated now whereas even with the codes i actually think there's like a negative engagement when it comes to promo codes now because they're they've just been saturated to death they've yeah. too you many just, people it's, it. it's washed you just you kind of look over them now there's so many of them it doesn't grab your attention you know you kind of have to be a little bit more creative in other ways i suppose and then would you so would you be more benefit or would you be more looking towards you know the, the other side of things then when in terms of the micro influencers and the kind of small local local celebrities i suppose you know and um, you know that have a bit of a following yeah like I, I i give you an example if if we had a branch in cork we we don't know but if we had a site in cork and someone was saying me right dennis you won't be able to get them to cork every well on day we might be getting the car out of this <laughs> yeah <laughs> but like if, if i was a cork business and i was looking for someone you'd probably be going for someone under 10k and i tell you why right we'd say using the car example now that probably won't work for a lot, a lot of businesses but like to get to, to to get that type of chain reaction where it's like a big deal all of a sudden like using a micro influencer it'll mean more to them they'll do more for you but on top of that the reaction you'll get will probably be bigger than because I like you know we'd say a sports star who's got a like twenty k or thirty k people probably expect them now to get we'd say a free car or wh whichever product you think of they'll expect them to be gifted clothing whereas that person that doesn't have the a big of a following but still very active probably would you probably reach more other micro influencers who would probably shop by you um because of that and then you'll get more sales out of it that's that's what my thought would be on it anyway i'm not too sure it does vary business to business obviously and industry to industry but i i think going forward businesses should be investing in people that'll create content as opposed to just well you always figures. see it with cars you always see like you know whether it's a local 
you know, there's a local guy that plays for Leinster or Ireland or whatever, or there's, you know, as you said, the GAA star, the local soccer star, like I'd say Dave up there and Dave works with uh, Cork City FC, I'd say your lads all have cars, do they, Dave? Well, they do, yeah, all of them, every single <laughs> one of them. And I know no, no comment is actually the answer to that question. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're spot, like, you're, you're spot on. Like, I mean, I think for me, like the biggest death of, the, of influencer marketing is the term influencer because people by psychology hate being sold to they hate being thinking that i'm being influenced by something that is so blatantly obvious that i'm basically being made a fool of and i think that's why i would always veer if if there's any campaign that i'm running i'd always say if someone says to me oh what does he do he says he's an influencer i go right, he's a twat i'm not going to deal with him if someone turned around and says oh what does he do oh he makes youtube videos on food recipes i'd be like okay, that's good because he's renowned for the recipe and not for this weird kind of socio-psychological weird meta influence that he has over people. Do you know what I mean? So it's more, like you were saying there, it's all about the um, it's all about the content. Like even if you look at some of the bigger YouTube channels, like even if you go as far as, like let's say Casey Neistat, for example, no one describes Casey Neistat as an influencer. Or if you go even into the UK, the Sartered Food Lads, no one describes them as influencers. They're, you can say that they're influential, but that's not the point. The descriptor isn't specifically you're an influencer. And I think that's where the kind of um, the stigma almost around like this idea of being an influencer comes from. Because I mean, ultimately, and like there's an element, like you said it there, the fake it till you make it. Like there's an element of people think that a lot of these people are, are absolute idiots because, oh, you think you're an influencer. But at the same time, there's a lot of those people who also really, really want to be influencers. So there's this jealousy element then kind of filtering into that as well. So it's this really weird kind of toxic dynamic that's always constantly kind of um, constantly evolving. So no, I'd always, I totally agree with you. Go for, go for a group of influencers or an influencer who's going to create really, really good content that's going to support your brand in the long term as well, I think. Not just, not just kind of short term. Yeah, and like even touching on the Cork City thing, like if I was going working with Cork City in the morning, rather than giving the star striker uh, a car or whatever, getting a few photos of him kicking a ball around it, you should put that money that you'd spend on whatever, giving him the car, put that to the club and get the whole team involved because... Get a bus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But like, <laughs> do, 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 do you know, like I when we got that micro-influencer into that local garage or whatever up in Donegal, like the impact that had compared to getting someone, you know, famous in like chalk and cheese. Like, because what we did was we, we got a whole new pile of followers. Now, a lot of them are micro influencers who said like, geez, this crowd are willing to take a chance on, on, on us. And it's, 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 it's weird. It's, I think a lot of the stuff I'm doing is experimental to be honest with you. But like at the end of the day, the worst thing that can happen is, I say, right, that wasn't, we, we won't do that again and pull the plug. So well, I, I think thought, that's something businesses need to do as well, do a lot of trial and error with it. But I think you can be very lucky with the businesses you work with. Like you you obviously are with a business that is willing to do a lot of experimenting, you know, and, and giving you the rein to go and do that, you know. And uh, when you look at like a local business, they don't have the budget sometimes to even think about that. So it's all down to the organic, what, where can we be creative? And we've talked about it here before. So you, you can be very lucky in a business like that to, to be given the rein to do it. That being yeah. said, though, I would say, like, like we saw it now when we were working with O'Flint, like, I also think that if you've got a good brand, and particularly if you've got a good product, like, ultimately, if you've got a great brand, but your product is terrible, people aren't going to use it, right? But I think what you find is that if you've got a good, strong local brand, those micro-influencers, whatever the hell you want to call them, the people <laughs> with a decent following who people have a bit of time for, them lads, um they'll start communicating with you in that online environment anyway. Like we could even go through the local business scene here and going through all the usual, the usual kind of crew in terms of who'd be engaging with things. And they're not doing it because Joe, they're, they're trying to be, they're trying to be fucking influencers. They're just doing it because it's a social game on social media. So therefore you get that reciprocity mm -hmm. happening over time. So it's part, yeah, obviously having the ability to be able to experiment and to invest in kind of influencer marketing, et cetera. Um, we need to come up with a new name for influencer marketing. We'll come up with it by the end of the show. <laughs> I'm actually surprised you've been very tame tonight, Dave. Normally you go off on one when you start talking about influencers. Oh, I, I, some of them aren't. It's not to be fair, right? There's some people that are really, really good at. But like you said, the fake it till you make it. 
or anyone who calls themselves an influencer. If you call yourself an influencer, you are a, gu- a or guru. Or a guru. Oh. Yeah, a guru, a guru. Like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> the, the whole thing, though, is, and you're hitting it on the head with that. It's like you should be known for something else besides, like, your social stuff is really important what you do online because it's you're showcasing your abilities. But your abilities, and I think particularly when it comes to, like, I don't know, modeling and all that sort of jazz, when people are known for that, it's it's kind of, that's what's after setting the stereotype of just posting random photos of yourself doing random things and calling yourself an influencer. Whereas, like you were saying, if you're a big foodie around Cork and you call in and you get that really nice shot of that sausage or whatever, or the burger or whatever, like that's creating content for the business. And you're, and then that business will say, that's really valuable. Whereas, do you know, this idea of just posting a photo of yourself and tagging the brand, it, it's, it is kind of working, but that's not the whole point. You need to be adding value to the audience as opposed to just, just a captionist photo of yourself. 100%. Like you need to go back, right? If you take, if you take an influencer as basically the modern day celebrity, for want of a better, for want of a better kind of a kind of a, a reconceptualization, celebrities emerged out of either having a particular skill or a particular talent, and being a celebrity was a byproduct from that. But ultimately, the core thing that what you did, like no one is good at being a celebrity. Do you know what I mean? You're like like no one is a celebrity because they're good at being a celebrity. You're a celebrity because you're good at something else, which then people celebrate about you. And it's the exact same thing should apply to influencers. If you're really, really good at something, whether it be podcast, cooking, making coffee, whatever, it doesn't matter what it is. If people are interested in that and you're creating content around that, no problem with that at all. It's the people who actively want to be an influencer, but are completely talentless in their pursuit of that, which really, really annoys me. I think following on you mentioned there a few minutes ago about um we, we get off to the topic of influences before we go we go we, a we rabbit lose, hole. We go down a rabbit hole. But you mentioned there a few minutes ago about um modeling. That's another side of your kind of a string to your bow. You're involved in um Miss Galway, Miss Mayo, Miss Sligo, you've done all the kind of that end of things. Um just you you've it well you've it well sussed up in the West. Like you Dave, you must go up there and he'll look after you. I do, yeah. I, I was a Gillette model there back in the day before I lost all my hair. So what what where did that all that side of things come out of? Yeah, so I think all those I like I've 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 recently stepped away from the beauty pageant stuff um just due to to, to work mainly and a bit a bit in the media as well as under under the scrutiny of the press and you just gotta uh, step away from those things but um like I, I came across those just through a mutual friend that was it went to one he was a male model at the time and I, I was actually involved with the, the Cork Rose of Chile a friend of mine was in that and I was her escort for the night um not that type of escort like no the escort um the, the, the escort legitimate like, one the legitimate, yeah, the legitimate one. one the one in the tuxedo <laughs> But uh, no, I, I went to the, the Rose of Tralee, uh to the Cork selection, had a great night, thought it was great crack. And genu- genuinely, uh, it was it was like for all the girls, even the girls that didn't win, they all had a great time. It did so meant to be I, actually a, a, an actual great oh, bubble and crack. And, absolutely. And, laugh, like. and like it, it, it was so much crack that even the girls that didn't win went down to Tralee to support the girl that won. So like so that much they're fun. going, you bitch. <laughs> <laughs> but even even I, I went down. Or as gonna well. get us in trouble now. <laughs> International <laughs> Women's Day and you're making those sorts of derogatory comments. I like to say you, the listeners. Like, that I, should be, I should be up there. I should be up there. That's what they're saying. They're <laughs> well, saying you get I should a small be up bit there. Of that too now, in fairness. But no, it honest to God, it was there was so much crack and great few sessions out of it as well. Like like the, the lash up you have blown truly is great fun as well. And it, it really is like all about having a bit of crack. But after going to that, I was like, geez, I'd love to kind of get involved with this again next yeah. year. And then as it happened, I went to one of the those uh, beauty pageant events, realized there was nothing going on in Galway. So I said, well, this is just an open market for me. Now, the brand had been on its knees. Uh, the previous winner of Miss Galway from 2012 or something had won the whole thing and been stripped of her title for being too old. So I was like, geez, oh, I'll have to, particularly Christ. locally, I had to try and drum up a bit of like good per, uh, PR for it and make it seem yeah. like this is a great idea. And we were lucky, it was around this time last year, I'd say it was 
just there last weekend, a year ago, we, we ran the event just before COVID hit. But uh, it was great. And the, the girl that won, um, she's, the final's only happening this year. But it, it, was, it was all about kind of making sure everyone had a great time. Because I think a lot of the time, the stereotype you have around those type of events is they're catty. Do you know, it's all about what you look like or the, the new one. And Dave, you love this one. It's all about how many followers you have online. That was well, the other thing. I was going to bring that in. Like that, that probably, that whole event and scene and, you know, it probably actually benefits you in a way in terms of your day-to-day work to being involved in, you know, these, you know, people with followings or giving you ideas or looking at constantly at people that are content creating, you know, to get ideas and stuff. It probably just benefits overall what you do, does it? Yeah, yeah, big time. And I think a lot of the time with those things is I'd make a mistake in the marketing of it. I do something that wouldn't work. And now I'm like, right, well, this won't work for this. Or even just dealing with that amount of people that all have a bit of a following. Like they were like effectively what we did was you have 30 micro influencers from one local region pumping out content nonstop. And I think that was one thing with all those events that I realized was so important. And I do it, we do it in the business I'm working in is, is pump out content on the daily as much as you can, organic stuff that you're making yourself. Because the more you put it out, the, the better the return. So that's why we post every day on online across all the socials. And like, it's just, it's something that like the content of it is so important. And particularly with events like that, because I think I gave myself six weeks every time to turn the whole thing around from start to finish. Jeez, so that's, yeah. And that's like recruiting the girls, building the hype, getting to the final and making sure everyone's having a good time. But as well, and it sounds mad, like the social capital of that whole thing and the value that the girl who enters um, gets is it's online. She doesn't like the days of, and I even saw it during the pandemic when we ran an event behind closed doors with the 50 people was that all the girls still had a great time because they were getting the, the reactions online. Now that was completely virtual, but like, well, bar the girls themselves, social distance inside, but it was just, it was fascinating to see that like from the, the customer, which is the girl in that scenario, uh, like they all still had a great time and the feedback was great, mainly because we made it an online thing where the experience was equally as, enjoyable and i think that's something a lot of businesses need to remember is making sure that customer at the end of the day comes away from your business and whatever it is and says do you know what that was that was good that was a good experience you know and what kind of ways would you look at that kind of experience um you know follow up and and, and relationship building in terms of the the motor trade what in, in Connolly is like what, what is there anything you do there specifically yeah, just and it's 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 so basic, but like just even like replying to the messages as quickly as possible. If someone has a complaint, genuinely pass them on. Do you know, re- reply as much as you can, and solve the queries yourself. And do you know, I think that's something we're trying to get better at, and something we can definitely improve on is the speed at in which we reply. Because when they message in, it's me they get. Now I I know a good bit, but I I probably can't negotiate your car deal with you. So yeah. it's like. And the, it's making sure that sales guy gets it straight away because if he doesn't, they'll be gone. And I think it's the same with a lot of businesses. And I know myself as a customer, do you know, when you ring up a place and they don't ring you back or they don't get back to you within a day at least, do you know, it's just leaving that too long or even just simple things like reviewing your customer journey as well. Like, because if you've got something inherently um, that's disrupting that, it's going to like negatively affect your business and you won't even get the chance to, to sell them the product. So like I give you an example. The first thing I did when I took over the reins of that beauty pageant was I realized that the, the application process was too long. The girls had to email in, email back, get a fucking messenger, send in photos and all this stuff. So I said, you know what? Screw that. We'll make a Google doc fill out the form apply and i'll review it and that's what we did and straight away it was just right you meet the criteria you're a finalist you're a finalist yeah, and just simplify it yeah yeah because nobody at the end of the day wants to go right i'm going to fill out this big long form have i got some decent photos that's the one thing they don't want and it's it's the same with any business even like when you're ordering online like how many clicks does it take to get to the checkout do you know and it's just important to remember that like keeping the customer happy will is the, the the main thing always you know 
Yeah, I think an another kind of so that's one string to your bow, and we move on to another one now. Is you were kind of very much involved in a lot of um, you know, kind of a uh, online kind of podcasts, and you know, we talked about content creation stuff as well. Like so, podcasts and kind of you know, obviously us two Egypts are at it here like every week, but podcast is definitely on the rise, I suppose, um, and audio. And I even actually only saw you put up with, uh, a post on Instagram the other day about you know the rising clubhouse, and me and Dave have talked about it a couple of times over the last week. You know, we were talking about. We talked about all these new platforms here. It seems to be on the rise. Next thing, it had a bit of trouble with um with data breaches or whatever it was, and you know, so it's kind of it's an infant, it's in its infancy stage at the moment. But what way do you think, in terms of social content creation, do you think audio is definitely the next one? Like, you know, we hear a lot of people talking about it, but do you think it's something that every brand should somewhere be looking at putting their their time and effort into? Yeah, I I think it's something that you no, know, it there's probably a podcast for everything already. But I think locally there probably isn't a podcast about specific, you know, things. And it's just making sure, well, my thought on the whole thing would be don't focus too much on one thing. So what I, how I ended up getting into the podcasting side of things was I actually, when I was doing my YouTube channel, loads of people would call me like a podcaster. But it was like I wasn't making podcasts. I was making videos. But I got a lot of messages of people saying, would I release the, so I was interviewing people. And it was a case of, would you release them as a podcast? Because people hated listening to them um, through, the, through YouTube or whatever. And I was just like, at the time, I was like, nah, it's too much work for me. I don't know how to do that. But like looking back, that's how I do all the podcasts I do. I'll record them either as a video. And for work, for example, now we've got our own podcast, the Connolly Motor Group podcast. Big shout out. <laughs> Big shout out. We've only got one episode out. Dave, right up the bill there, will you? <laughs> um but no like the thing was i i did that interview i released it on video and audio and you can do both and you might as well do both because like if you don't get the person that'll listen to the podcast you'll get someone that'll watch the podcast and i i think it's it's a great way of well if i was owning it if i if i owned a different type of business i'd probably be getting different customers on and chatting to them about their experience and kind of rope in the product or whatever they use, do you know. So like, and and that's something that like we so we what, are doing. What kind of content do you do at the moment for the for the content? Like what what do you specific like you you host it? Do you? Yeah. So we'd have the different brand ambassadors on, um, mm -hmm. and we also so what we're going to do is we're going to mix in a lot of the motor industry stuff as well. So it's going to be a kind of a mix and match of. Do you know, like the episode we've out is uh, with Joe Canning. So it's like the only interview of Joe Canning's done. Uh, talking about him, his life, which is pretty cool. I didn't realize there was no other podcast with him, and like like that, the press picked it up and it was on Sky Sports and stuff. So like the publicity you can get when you get obviously the right guest on now, it wouldn't be everyone that have access to the likes of him. But just I I think having content like that is great because not only can you use the audio bites on your social, where you might be talking about oh we've got a new product or something or we're doing this service or something, but you also have got like like people listening to this podcast, you'll get a, a, a fan base built up very quickly. Because I know myself, I listen to the same podcast the whole time when I'm out for the walk. I mm. throw the two of you on now when I'm out for the walk and by the time it's over, I'm back home it make, again. It make, it make you get around the laps quicker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm out, out to Salt Hill and back in record time since I started listening to you. But it's it's weird because like, and I think people are so used to routine and with the way this whole lockdown stuff has gone, having a presence in audio is super important because that's what people are doing. We're sick of watching stuff now at this stage. So it's it's like, it's, I don't know, something for the ears, <laughs> just pop in the headphones. And have you it's found- It's so and well, right? I mean, I like, I find even myself, it's a lot of effort to go and find a YouTube video. Let's say you're eating lunch. Finding a YouTube video of 10 minutes is useless because then you've got to go find another one almost and you're not going to turn on Jogo searching for something on Netflix. Whereas if I listen to five podcasts or say whatever month I listen to, it's very easy for me to go on and go, oh yeah, notification, this person here has a new podcast, click. You're listening to something instantaneously and you don't need to, you can focus on your laptop, if you're eating, if you're looking out the window, whatever, it doesn't matter. It's just there and it's transient. Whereas I think if you have something which is obviously multi-sensory, which is what video is in terms of sound and um, sound and um, visual as well, it's more effort to consume that content. And I think that's why it's so it's so powerful, I think, nowadays. And especially now, like, like you said it there, people going for walks, 
people spending more time filling time, if that makes any sense. And um, and podcasts are a great, a great way to do that. And, we talked about it a couple of weeks ago that and um, you know it was interesting there when you said I wasn't bothered doing the the, the visual to audio you know I wasn't going to take the, the track off it and we and we tossed about you know and initially should we push you know up the video version or whatever like you know not that anyone wants to be fucking watching us each week on YouTube but we, but we tossed we, about initially go back and edit that after <laughs> 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 <We> did. <laughs> That's stop now, right? Well, we, 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 we did, we had a chat about what, what's interesting coming down the line is um, Spotify are, we, we only talked about a couple of weeks ago, Spotify are changing their model again slightly on the back of having Joe Rogan or whatever, you know, that they're now adding in the full visual clip as well. But what I think is going to be very beneficial is the fact that when you click out of it, you're still listening to the audio. So you don't have that element on YouTube unless you pay for it, which not many people are going to do. I, I know personally I wouldn't like so. So I do think if you're going down the route of podcasts, you probably have to consider that element probably of it as well. You know, and, then, and then I'm personally I'm fed up of seeing square heads and zoom boxes, you know. So until I think we get out of this whole situation and we can do it a little bit better. Um, in terms of where it's a you know studio or whatever it is, you know, um, I think it's 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 kind of washed and it's been done in terms of the visual, but I think it's definitely a platform coming down the line that people need to look at. Yeah, d- definitely, and I, I think one thing that all those um, platforms, the likes of Spotify and even Instagram now, and I think Facebook have just given up, to be honest with you, but particularly, and I know you were touching on it last week about Twitter bringing in like. Um, kind of almost like a Patreon Jesus. version, oh, yeah. like Instagram are doing that now for creators. I I seen it there. There's a guy I can't think of his name. I follow him on Twitter. He has all these unbelievable Instagram breaking news. Now sometimes he's about six months too soon before we actually get it, but he um like even with the Instagram like with the four way chats, yeah. Um, but like they're they're making it so much easier now to get to to make money on the platform because I'd say they've they've been losing a lot of people to the likes of Patreon. And even I suppose only fans as well to a certain degree. There's uh, there's people that are kind of resorting to that to make money online. And I think there's like affiliate uh, marketing now coming in on uh, Instagram, for example. So I I think the way it's going to be going is whether you're doing it like video or whether you're doing it on audio. There's going to pe- people are looking to monetize their content a lot quicker than they used to be. And I think I've even seen that with like. A lot of the people that I would have known from a couple of years ago, they would, all of a sudden now they have a Patreon straight away. Like there's, do you know the way people typically would say, hey, I'll wait, I'll build up the following and then I'll switch to, to, to the money side of things or whatever. Whereas now it's a case of, right, I'm going to set my Patreon very affordable, two euro a month or something like that. See how many I can get in and then build it from there. And I, I think that's the way it's going to go for a lot of content creators. Whereas for businesses, I think the... The model is just to try and get out as much content as you can across the platforms, to be honest with you. But do you think like, you can you know, pull that as well, though? I think, like, I mean, like I've said, a constant, like social media is meant to be social, right? Yeah. The problem is, is that if you open up the floodgates where everyone thinks they can make money yeah. on Instagram, or so it kills all the platform. Like we spoke last week about um, uh, the TikTok kind of feed and people being able to tag products that they're wearing or whatever and kind of the feed and that, how that might work. But if people start creating content for the purpose of selling rather than for the purposes of creating content, it's going to kill a lot of these platforms. Cause again, people don't like being sold to um, and particularly they don't like being sold to by people who they actually like consuming content from. So again, I think people are going to have to be, um, people are going to have to be very, very careful of bridging that gap between charging people for content that was free previously and that they can probably get elsewhere unless you're a Joe Rogan of the world um, versus just looking to monetize via you know, social commerce or whatever the case may be. But what do you think when it comes to the likes of, so, you know, we kind of briefly touched on it there in terms of you have so many people now going into the, the podcast world, I suppose, you know, and, and we did as well, but we, you know, we, we've, we've talked about before where, you know, a lot of people go into it and straight away want that Patreon. Wait, you know, there was a thing there about it was a buy me a coffee was popping around there for a while. And um, you can set up that kind of stuff or literally just go pure out and get a sponsor for the show. Um, do you think that, you know, that that side of things will definitely ruin it as well in terms of people? You know, I just feel that, you know, we'll never say no to a sponsor if they want to come on. We'd have a chat with them. We'd love a car. You know, if you're thinking, you no, know, then, you know, and you're a in car, tomorrow. I'll take, I'll take the coffee. <laughs> you'll take the coffee, yeah. I'll drive the car and you'll take the coffee, right? 
But um, you know, it's it's not something that we we set this up to do in terms of you know make money or or have a sponsor and all this kind of stuff though. But I think a lot of people that go into this area are, are going to get disappointed fairly fairly quickly do you know that that's not something that everyone wants to sponsor or whatever do you think that's going to ruin that side of stuff yeah and i, I think you can probably even look at a lot of things it's probably ruined instagram um and it's probably ruined I, I'm, I'm not too sure I, I i can't really remember what facebook was like before it completely died out it was so long ago but like if you look at instagram and even tiktok now um, like the second they'll, they'll monetize, even with the Instagram update, when they put the shopping tab down, like it, it really does disgruntle people because like Dave was saying, people don't like to be sold to too directly. Yeah. Um, and it's, it is now a case of, and I, I think it's, it's feeding into this culture of people like the customer theoretically on paper should want loads of stuff. And I think it's, it's becoming like a vicious circle of you'll have the crowd, the have and the have nots and it's a case of any of all these like people in between making a quick box here and there. I even saw there this week or in the last couple of weeks, pyramid schemes are back on Instagram, for example. So it's like, what the hell? Like, it's just people are so money obsessed now online. And the, and there's there's a lot of begrudgery in, in the case of you actually put out a post. Actually, I remember seeing a few few months or a few weeks back ago about to, roughly what you'd nearly be paying for an influence yeah. or something you know and the benefits you could have from the different a hierarchy of, yeah, yeah. I, I, that took that was the second lockdown no i had a lot of time in my hands and i said <laughs> you know what now? i'll make up an old graph but uh no and it, it is so true though like it, you do pay for what you get with these things like when you do hire someone that's got a big following like even though like you're talking like you're talking like i, I won't say who it was or anything but like i was quoted a couple of months back from someone two grand the post for either a story or a, a grid. Now, that two grand a post would get you top tier in terms of Irish influencers. But like like that, it's like... And then you look at... It, the, the problem with it is that's the top tier two grand a post. Now, that person is also working full time, but they're the top tier. So like John or Mary, who's got like 10K in Cork or wherever, saying to you, I want 200 euro. I'm not really I'm not the best at the old maths but when you when you add that up it kind of it doesn't trickle down the way you'd want it to if that makes sense so when you like you're saying there Dave like if you're coming on right I'm going to make loads of money off this I'm going to push these products like the return you're going to get from the effort is is minimal because the market's already saturated and unfortunately a lot of these people that are now content creators it's like fashion beauty yeah it's and then you have random niches. Um, I have a friend of mine, Owen Sheen, who's uh, he's a TV chef and he's got his own food oh, yeah, company yeah, yeah, in Limerick. Yeah. But like Owen's got his own niche there. He's he's a young food blogger. Mikey Olden's another good example there Mikey in Cork. In Cork, of Cork someone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but again, like we were saying, like the two of them, they're chefs primarily. They're creating food and recipes yeah, it's not that's something that, it's not something they went into they actually come from a chefing background exactly you know, so yeah they but, can stand by what they're doing but again if you look at that market it's so not saturated there's probably a couple of there's probably a lot of foodies but in terms of chefs that are producing recipes online in a real easy to follow manner i don't really know anyone else part of two of them but i think it's 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 hard for the honest end is on them that they have to break through they have to promote that you know in a, in a in a kind of nice way i suppose they have to show that they are worth their salt that they are they're in this game because they're passionate they're skilled they're educated in that area you know so they they have a personal battle then which as you said the foodies that can't really stand by or show you whether the piece of paper or whatever it is behind their their craft yeah absolutely but i i, I think the problem with it is the markets that you'd like to get into are you know, on paper, a lot of people want to get into. They're so heavily saturated. Whereas if you just skew to the left or right into something, you'd be like, for example, when I was doing those interviews and stuff, people would have known me because it was a case there was no one else doing it. So it's it's quite easy to be really good at it when no one else is doing it. Whereas with podcasts or anything, like if you are looking to start one, my advice to anyone would be find something that maybe particularly locally there's no one else doing because the second you start something else up you're going to just be compared to you're either copying them or do you know what yeah. i mean there's there's a competitiveness there whereas that's what i like about your podcast is you're not trying to be like someone else's marketing podcast it's the two of e and i think that's something a lot of people do they'll say do you know what we'll do now we'll rip off such and such a podcast or 
the big one, for example, in Ireland would be the two Johnnies. Yeah. It's like, let's do the two Johnnies or whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's become its own little style. Like, you know, obviously they're, you know, I, I love their stuff. I think it's absolutely fantastic, you know, and they're they're definitely doing it right in my eyes. But, um, you know, their style of comedy then obviously comes from the Unbelievables and that kind of Irish kind of comedy, you know, but they're doing it totally different. You know, and they even had Pat Short on their show before and talked about it with him and, you know, he couldn't be more complimentary to them but it's they're taking a style and doing their own thing with it which is very very important but in terms of hosting a podcast you know you do all the stuff on social in terms of building your own personal brand and Dave loves this whole area of um building a personal brand do you know do you look he's already off <laughs> do, you, do you do you think um what what is your thoughts around building actually a personal brand like do you think that's a benefit in terms of um being a market like as we already said dave doesn't use social media but he's involved in that whole scene do you know do you think it's a it's important basically to build a personal brand um i i think it can be i think now i think nowadays you do i think you do because i think when i went into that job interview for the job i'm working in i needed to sell myself and the first thing the manager did was check me out on linkedin and that's that's where I'm putting a lot more of my efforts nowadays. And you probably even seen my Instagram with the last couple of months. I've been spewing out as much marketing stuff as I can. And it's just the reason I'm doing that is it's going to, to, to kind of validate myself online in that sense. But I think it's really important that in a couple of years time or whenever I go, if I was to ever leave my job or if, if I wanted to progress up, I need to either be showing my boss currently look, I know my stuff here, or be someone else, I, I know my stuff here. And I think that's something I was really conscious of when I was doing the master's was like, right, what more can I put up on my LinkedIn? And I, 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 I get the cynicism towards it because it's a lot of like, look at me, I'm fantastic and all this, but like, it's a dog eat dog world out there now. And like, at the end of the day, when I was coming out of my master's, everyone is the same piece of paper. We all have roughly the same grades. Do you know that bit that'll differentiate me from everyone else's? I've done these events. I've done these. Your different. portfolio, basically. Yeah. Yeah, I can do. I can do. Every, I can do. I, I literally can try to do a bit of everything for you. Um, but like, I think that that's really important now because prior to this, it was a case of, and look, a lot of it is still kind of who you know and how you know I'm kind of job. Yeah. But a, a lot of the stuff now, particularly online, if you are trying to get into the marketing world, it's like. Where is your podcast? Where is your, do you know what I mean? Like you, you can talk to talk, but can you walk to walk with it? And I think that's something that I'm always trying to do anyway, as, as best I can, even though the, the more it sounds mad, but the more I'm working in the marketing stuff online and just particularly the social stuff, the more uh, disillusioned I'm getting with it, that I'm like, this is insanity. A lot of it. Uh, like that story I was telling you there about that, that, that person that was pretending they were sponsored, but like, the, the consumers it's a, it's it. a it is a lot of it is a game yeah. like, it is a game yeah it's mad what's I, your thoughts on that Dave in terms of um like obviously Dave does lecturing in UCC and will be lecturing to you know undergrads and, and masters and stuff like Dave do you do you um do you ever talk about building a brand for yourself or when you leave no I think it's the most it's the most ridiculous term I've ever come across in my life I don't <laughs> I don't get it I don't understand it because every everything that we do now has to be commoditized and corporatized and sold right so people start talking about like part your personal brand why can't we just talk about like people and what they do and why they're good at what they do and why they're passionate about something and why they're good why does everything need to be sold do you know what i mean as a kind of a commodity and to me that's my main problem with the kind of the so if you take the if even if you go back to jonathan healy a number of them um, a number of episodes ago he differentiated between marketing and PR. He said, PR is other people saying good things about you. Branding is you saying good things about yourself. And I think that when you start conceptualizing the idea of a personal brand, it becomes very, very narcissistic and individually focused. And you lose sight of the ecosystem that you exist in very, 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 very clearly. Like the best piece of advice that I ever got, and I give it to my students every single year because it was a brilliant piece of advice by a guy called Barry Guiney a number of years ago. And he said, the opportunities in your life, in your professional life will expand and contract based on, um, based on a number of variables. That's your pretend propensity to, to take risks and um, the size of your network and your reputation within that network. And if you can tick those three boxes, you're going to do okay. And that's not just you 
kind of, again, this idea of the personal brand. And I think the idea of brand as well is that there's an element of kind of falsifying things when it comes to branding. Brands aren't what they are. Brands are... But how, but how, do you, but how, do you, how would you suggest then someone coming out of college to actually, you know, as you said there about your reputation, how do you actually get your reputation then nowadays? Well, the, so the, the first thing that you do, and I say this to all my students, because the worst piece of advice that everyone gives students is go and follow your passion, which is utter bullshit. <laughs> go and find what you're good at. Yeah. And that's the core thing, because there's too many people out there saying, I'm this and I'm that. And I know I know we're saying that we're making a podcast, but that's all right. We've got other jobs as well. But uh, like <laughs> if you go and you say, oh, like, what do you do? It's, oh, I, I'm passionate about this. I'm passionate about that. I'm passionate about this. Like that doesn't do anything. What are you good at? Find out what you're good at and double down on making what you're good at useful to other people and then bring other people into your network then in terms of like, like I know myself, if I go in, um, if I'm doing a consultancy project, the amount of work that I do, people probably look and say, is actually very, very minimal because I go in and I project manage. And most of my and project does, managing. He does is that there. fairly well, then it's not like there. I tell you, I'll project manage the life out of something, it'll be brilliant. But what I'll do is that if they say, okay, we're launching a campaign on this, I have my graphic designer that I know is shit hot. I have my videographer who I know is shit hot. I have my web, my web guy. Why no, whatever the case may be. So by having that ecosystem and using other people's kind of talents and bringing that together, that's what I am reasonably good at, I would say, in terms of in terms of them. Um, I don't know what you want to call it, that kind of more strategic or project management, whatever, whatever kind of whatever kind of phrase you want to put on it. But like it, like it took a while for me to understand that. And you try like we all do it, right? When you come out of college, you try a bit of graphic design you try doing a bit of social media management and then you try, you try all different things and it's only until you find out what you're really good at that then you can start actually making use of things. Whereas I just feel when people start talking about personal brand, like you see it on LinkedIn quite a lot. And again, if you're communicating useful content, I have no problem with that whatsoever. What I have an issue with is people who have nothing useful to say at all, but they keep on telling about everyone how great they are. And it just comes across as incredibly narcissistic, adding no value to anything not contributing to any kind of a conversation and it don't like it doesn't do anything for you yourself because you come across as a bit of a fucking asshole should be told if you do it the wrong way so again i'd be and like there's other things in that when we talk about personal brand and particularly with students i'm very very cognizant of this with the whole kind of growth of this idea of personal brand you also forget about a lot of the other things that are important when you're going into an organization the importance of um, the importance of understanding organizational politics, the importance of communication, the importance of finding variance in your organization in terms of if you're going into um, you go into an organization and everyone's really, really good at Excel. There's no point in you also being very, very good at Excel because you're not going to stand out in that organization. So there are so much other stuff going on that it's not that I necessarily have an issue with the idea of, of the idea of communicating what you're good at and value, but I have an issue with the concept of the personal brand because it ignores the person bit and it more so focuses on the brand i'll i'll, I'll shut up now that's a bit <laughs> done there no i think i think that look i do think that's absolutely crucial in terms of um you know like like take for example we've come from influencer marketing and you know, we've talked about that and you briefly mentioned it there a while ago dave in terms of um you know this whole idea of it's not influencer it's more so influential do you know so like say for example the content now you would put out then it's like you know that's a benefit to me do you know and i would follow that stuff for tips and advice you know and dave you mentioned um um what's the video guy's name uh american guy or canadian guy nice uh, like, nice yeah i can never say that uh you mentioned him like his his content you know is very um influential you know, and he would be uh, not influencer, but he would be influential to a, co a core following that he would have. So I think it's it's that fine line that you don't want to cross over. I think, and that's and that's the important thing. Yeah, and just even touching on that, what Dave's saying there, something I'm after realizing and see more and more of it with the with the lockdown is, I think people are getting so particularly people that consume content as much as they create it. And kind of a bit of both, particularly, and you were saying there, the narcissistic side of things. I think all of this social stuff, and because we're all isolated now in each other's homes for the most part, I think there's a there's a level of competition there online now. And it's, it's also true for businesses, but more so for like individuals. And 
that idea that I think it was you meant Gary Vaynerchuk was the first guy I saw to kind of talk about this game and all this sort of jazz. But the likes of him, I think he's after setting a precedent online and fair play to him. He's very successful. But I think it's this idea of like the hustle and all this sort of jazz and this idea that like, oh, you yourself can kind of, you know, dominate the industry and all this sort of jazz, which is great for some people. But like, it's not a one size fits all thing. And I think there's a gray area starting to emerge online where it's like it is people are their own brand and it's so fake. And but even to the point that they're believing the lies and the, the the fakeness. And it's it's a very scary place, that gray area that I'm talking about, because I think it's kind of going beyond that idea of the personal brand. It's like, oh my God, I am this person in real life as much as I am online. And it's it's very dangerous. And I think for people's mental health long term, it's going to be a very crude awakening. We, we'll see it in another couple of years develop, but I think it's only going to get a lot worse, unfortunately. But uh, from a business side of things and from my own personal kind of, I suppose, brand, as you want to say, I kind of use it as best I can to you know, get opportunities and create opportunities for myself that I possibly wouldn't get. And I think that's the way you got to use it. And like you were saying there, Dave, try and give a bit of value to other people within the industry. Yeah. But I think this idea of saying like, oh, I'm unbelievable because I do this, that and the other, there's a lot of narcissism with it, um, yeah. which is unhealthy at times. It's and, a good the point. Core, and the core fundamentals, regardless of what you're communicating online, if you're not good at what you do, doesn't matter what you put up online because no one's going to believe it. Like if you're putting up, um, if you've done your research on Clubhouse and people know you from being good at marketing, then they might listen to what you say about Clubhouse. If you're not good at what you do and you create the best content in terms of all these top things, people aren't going to take any weight in that because it's like, yeah, but he doesn't know what he's talking about. So why would I consume this particular piece of content? Like what I'd always say to, and I say it to the kids that I'd be, um, the kids, the, kids, the guys that I'd be kids. speaking like, <laughs> The, um, like, if you're, and if we take the, and I keep on saying this to people, 70%, close to 80% of marketing jobs aren't advertised, yeah. ultimately. People ask other people in the industry, have you got someone who's good at this? Have you got someone who's good at that? Three last week, the exact same thing. I will recommend someone based on my working with them and whether they were good or not, not based on whether they have, again, this idea of, like, are they influential? Are they a personal brand and stuff like that? So I, I think people... Again, it's why I just get irritated by the term. It's just because when you say personal brand, it implies one thing, where there's so much more going on. And I think actually what the problem is now is that we all use it. Like I actually use it probably when I'm lecturing just on the fly, even though I hate it, because it's just become so synonymous with career progression and the industry. And you have, to, and again, it goes back to your Vayner chucks and all this is this world, you know, and it's like, it's just not, it's just not true. Like if you look at the, if you look at the, the research or the evidence or the data supporting where people progress in their career, the amount of social media followers that they have is not a very good variable to, to prove out that regression over time. Like, mm -hmm. I didn't say it put people off, actually. Do you know, it's probably, probably would oh, put yeah. off getting oh, a yeah. job. A lot of the time they said, geez, this guy's got a, an ego as big as the CV. <laughs> Oh, the only reason that I'm doing this podcast is that I've got permanency. If I wasn't on permanency, forget about it. Not a hope in hell would I be talking to stuff he that said, I'm talking he's, about he's, here. He's, he's challenged it a few times, I can guarantee you that. <laughs> oh, damn. Like, See how far he can take that contract. At home going, oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> What's he after saying? I think, um, no, look, um, we'll wrap it up there, I think, and that was absolutely fantastic. If people want to go and follow you, where would they find you? After oh, all that, I'm on, I'm on a bit of everything, but you no, know, you can follow me on Instagram. That's where I'd like you to follow me. It's uh, at the Dinny Crow Show. Perfect. Lovely. I'm currently on hiatus now. I just need to get my get my life together after being disillusioned by social media last week. <laughs> Sorry, Dave will perk you up there and get you back. And <laughs> you, know, you know, do you know what you do if you if you don't if, if you if you want to really kind of roil yourself up, just type in Markle into Twitter and just read the comments for the evening, and it's just like, <laughs> oh my Jesus Christ, so much. <laughs> Right, we'll wrap it up there. Look, uh, Dennis, thanks very much for coming on. Really, really appreciate it. Um, thanks for everyone for listening. Um, and once again, you can follow us across social media on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, the usuals. And uh, thanks very much. Take care. Thanks, so much, guys. I do appreciate it.